Welcome to Buckets. This is Action Network's WNBA betting podcast presented by BetMGM. I'm your host, Maria Marino, along with our experts, Jim Turvey and Dano Mattia. You may recognize us from a season ago. We actually did this podcast on our Buckets NBA feed. This season, we have our own feed, so please subscribe and get to know us a little bit better Jim and Dano, Whew, we have got quite the season in store. Jim, how are we feeling? Uh, I mean, I joked about this on Twitter. Like, I've been counting down the seconds to the WMB season for like months. That was a really big number when you're counting seconds for months. <laughs> it's now like feasible. The, the The preseason is here today. The season is here like 11 days from now. It, we're, it's all coming together. It's so close. It's here. I'm so excited. I cannot wait. Excited to break down all of the teams, all the games, all the angles. Betting the W is great. Watching the W is great. I can't wait. I'm ecstatic. Dano, it's all happening. It is. And it was joy to be at the, the WBA draft with both of you. Um, I've never seen a draft uh, at the WBA. I've been there for the past three or four years. Uh, with that much money put into it, uh, the fact that they had an open bar for us was a a great call then seeing uh future number one pick page beckers go up to marie and say how much she she missed you was like probably the highlight of of my night for sure well that was definitely the highlight of my night too because you took a photo of us and i think i have four thousand likes and counting on my instagram post with that photo featuring page and of course AP Pud. i'm glad you brought up the draft too because we had such good vibes there. We had this sort of cocktail hour, like atmosphere. We were seeing players and coaches walk around. Those are the types of vibes I want to bring to this podcast right here. Just us hanging out, talking ball, and it's the perfect time for it. The draft had 2.4 million viewers, which was far and away the most that it's ever had. Obviously, coming off a historically viewed women's college basketball season. So there is a lot to get into. This is our Western Conference season preview. So we're going to go through six teams in the West. And then we're going to do another episode dropping Tuesday with our Eastern Conference preview. But let's dive into it. And the reason I wanted to start with the West is because we have the reigning back-to-back -back champs in the West. So we'll start talking with the Las Vegas Aces being the uh, title favorites. Once again, they're plus 100 on MGM. Then we'll kind of go through uh, all the rest of the teams based on shortest to longest odds. All right, so we got the Aces. They were 34-6 and six last season, just a absolute juggernaut and you can find their win total around 32 and a half Jim <laughs> do we think that the aces can top what they did a season ago so okay in all fairness we need to we need to flashback Maria you and I <laughs> we fit we faded these aces a little bit we the whole playoffs we kept saying Liberty like I, at this number and now now a lot of it was at the number right I think both of us, if you'd asked us, we would have said, yes, the Aces are the more likely team to win. But at this number, we like the Liberty. Now, you know, they didn't play out that way. And the Liberty had their chance. They had Chelsea Gray go out. They 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 had they were at home. It was a game four. The energy was there. And they just really let, you know, betters who were backing them and their fans down. It was not a good end of the season for the Liberty, but it was an incredible season an incredible end to the season for the aces. It, it in a lot of ways proved the idea that, you know, last year wasn't a fluke. I don't think people thought it was a fluke, but it was like, Hey, that was, you know, the first year we now have another super team. Can you compete with that super team? They lost Candace Parker, you know, mid season. They were, it didn't matter. They had an answer for every single thing. I think that's a credit to Becky Hammond, but I think it's really a credit to a lot of the core that is back. Asia Wilson, Jackie Young, Kelsey Plum. The, the team is incredibly stacked. That being said, I, I'm looking to fade them again. I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe I'm doing this again. All of the things I just said, take them into account. I, I promise I don't have a bias against the Aces. I just think that the numbers on them are always, the market knows how good they are. So right. here's, here's let me walk through the logic beyond just um, 32 and a half or even 33 and a half is a crazy win total to have. So last year, 
this team came out of the gates just absolutely unreal. I think they won 18 of their first 20, maybe even 19 of 21. And with Candace, and that was with Candace in lineup. So I'm not even using just an arbitrary endpoint. With Candace in the lineup, they were a plus 17.6 net rating team. When Candace left the lineup, they looked human. They were down, they dropped, they still were about a 31 win pace team, which is an outstanding team. But after Candace went out, the Liberty and the Aces looked about even, which is why, again, we talked ourselves into those bets. Now, in a postseason atmosphere, I don't think I'm going to fall for that again. But over the course of a long season, 34 wins is an insane bar to have to hit, or even 33 is an insane bar to have to hit for a regular season total. If and here's one, here's one thing I think that's that's pretty big about this. I regardless of Chelsea Gray's status coming into the season, which is the point I'm about to bring up, I do like this under. If Chelsea Gray misses any time, I love this under. We haven't heard a lot of of updates on her. She missed, she had to go out of the postseason. Uh, with that foot injury, she's working her way back right now. We haven't, again, I haven't seen good intel. If people have, please shoot me a DM. I would love to know the latest on Chelsea. I don't think they have any reason to rush her back. If they if they face injuries during the regular season, I don't think they have any reason to rush people back through those injuries because they know they're going to be in the playoffs. They know they can beat every team in the playoffs, to, to be perfectly blunt about it. However, I don't think they, there's a reason for them to push to 33, 34 wins. So to me, I I, I predict this, I project this team around 31 to 33 teams. So 33 wins with the depth issues they have. If Chelsea misses time, that number could drop even a little bit. They, they really don't have the bench to kind of, you know, provide any sort of stability if, if players go out. In a, in a sense, the Candace Parker injury was the best option for them because Kia Stokes was their best, best bench player. So I, I think that this is a really high number. If you want to be on the aces, totally understandable. That's a, a good corner to be on. I think the way to do it is Asia Wilson for MVP. We saw her lose out last year and then prove in the finals. I'm the real MVP. I'm the best player in yes. this league. I promise you, you know, Stewie is great, but I am the best player in this league. So you can find her MVP numbers out there at almost plus 200, maybe in that plus 175 range. I think if you want to be on the aces, that's the way to go. I, I think this win total is really high. I think that there's some depth questions. I also think there's just why push for a third straight regular season when we're going to, we know we're going to be exhausted going for a third straight title. So I can't believe I'm here again. I am fading the aces, which seems <laughs> dumb, probably is dumb to be honest, but it's where I land when I look at this roster and look at the, the questions that they, they may face this regular season. Get ready for aces fans to be at you. Know. you. They should, yes, they should, me. honestly. But- But at the same time, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. And just to set the stage for anyone who might be a little bit new to the WNBA and this league. So we have one of the legends of the game, Candace Parker, who just recently announced her retirement. Jim brought up, you know, first half of the season last year. I mean, the Aces were setting records as far as their productivity, their start to the season. And you're right. Second half, they dropped off a little bit. Partly that's you know, without Parker, I think um, they did lack a bit of depth and they were a little tired. Part of why we like the Liberty um, <laughs> going into the postseason was because um, the Aces looked a little gas. Now, it never really came into play because they were able to just squeak by with that one seed and have home court advantage. Um, so in the postseason, they were able to be rested. They got a very favorable, um, not very, but a a more favorable draw. Um, So there's that. And then Chelsea Gray, if you're not familiar with her game, she's arguably the most important player. Asia's your MVP. Totally get that. Chelsea Gray is an amazing facilitator. And you could, I mean, she was the finals MVP the prior year. So um, Chelsea Gray getting hurt in the finals. And to your point, it's a little, it's actually a little crazy. Um, and it shows that there still is a little bit of a gap in WNBA coverage. Cause I'm Googling Chelsea gray injury and I don't, I'm not really seeing what her update is. We'll probably find out more as camp goes on, but to your point, there's a good chance that she is going to miss some time. Um, that being said, Dan, I want you to chime in here on anything, um, betting wise that you lean with the aces. Maybe this is still one of the best teams and, Hard to forget that minimum 100 uh, 100 minutes played, like their lineup of Stokes, uh, Chelsea Gray, Asia Wilson, Kelsey Plum, and Jackie Young, uh, I think was third overall 
in terms of like best possible lineups in uh, offensive rating. And I think that's behind that lineup that had Candace Parker uh, and then behind like the Liberty, which you know, talked about how they had their chance. Uh, and then defensive rating that that lineup is number one in the WNBA. I do resonate with uh, Jim's comment about the bench, uh, but that's something we said all last year. Um, everyone talked about their, their lack of depth. Uh, they lost the starter, still ran away with it, uh, won a championship on New, York's, New York's home court. Uh, so, I mean, I think this might be something that I'm looking to play live. I know I think uh, I was on there over last year, which was set at 30. And um, I think it, when it got up to 35 and a half is when I when I played the under. And, I, you know, that probably or I guess that wouldn't have hit had the Los Angeles Sparks not knocked them off at home. I think they're the only team to beat Las Vegas at home last year. Just crazy to think about because Commissioner Cup doesn't count. Right. Uh, Liberty won that at Vegas. <laughs> um right so yeah i mean i i i think i think 32 and a half you you gotta think under like like jim's saying um if you're gonna bet it if not i'd stay away um you know maybe they lose a few to start the season maybe chelsea gray isn't right and then something you can take an over on uh i think we've you know if you've been following the, the aces the last few years under becky it's like they go on these streaks of just like 10 games in a row covering yeah. the spread every time. Then they go on these streaks of like eight games. And you're like, Hey, there's something wrong with the aces. Like they're, they're finding a way. Uh, I mean, we saw them at Atlanta last year uh, down by, I think 18 in the first half, come back and win when Asia had 53. Um, who else? They were down at Chicago by double digits, came back and won that game. Uh, it's just, they're a team that can be super profitable. So one other thing before we move on, I just I just feel like we should mention um, Megan Gustafson, a great addition for the Aces, but I'm pretty sure she's replacing Kayla George, who's playing on the Australian national team. So not necessarily an addition in terms of depth. Very excited about the rookie class, really hoping for the best for our friend Kate Martin from Iowa and also DeAsia Fair, who was drafted out of Syracuse. But the other part of this cap I think for the aces is the fact that some other teams have gotten better some other teams that the aces are going to be uh playing and so that brings me to the next team in the west that we want to discuss the Seattle Storm who are at about plus 1000 to win the title believe it or not third best odds so right now we're seeing them at better odds than the, the Connecticut Sun who uh were easily the third best team a season ago, you can find their win total about 23 and a half, 24 and a half. Uh, Dano, I'll go to you on this first uh, because we have uh, potentially another super team here. Skylar Diggins Smith. Could this be her revenge season? She did not play uh, at all last season for Phoenix uh, coming off of having a child. <laughs> and then Neka Aglumike, a former MVP a free agent addition to the storm. Yeah, I God, I'm so thankful <laughs> that one NECA got off the sparks. Like absolutely <laughs> don't want to waste any more years of that prime. I mean, she's so talented. And then, I mean, we forget like Skyler uh, led that Phoenix team. I mean, Griner was amazing throughout that playoff run, but led into the finals um, a few bounces away from knocking off Chicago, really. So, uh, we know how talented she is. It's probably great that she had a year off. Uh, and if you follow her on social media, you know that she's like super pissed. She wants to go oh, out yeah. and kill everybody. <laughs> uh, and I think with these veterans coming in, the experience that uh, I haven't always been the biggest fan of Coach uh, Quinn, but uh, Noelle has got some experience under her belt. She's had some, some good teams and some bad teams. So I think uh, this will be year three under her completely and that's great um you got great veterans coming in who have played for uh definitely some different coaches i mean that could play for some terrible ones um <laughs> it's, i mean I, I there's no way skylar enjoyed playing for vanessa so uh man it it, it could be an incredible roster i mean yes. i think we've seen with like the liberty bringing in stars like Sure, there's some games where there's growing pains, but it really didn't take them long to to gel together. 
And you saw that, like, arguably the best scorer in the league in Joel Lloyd. So it's an exciting team. I uh, I know I'm on their over before it moved a little bit. And uh, I think there's still value there to take, you know, a championship with this team. Um, Neck has done it before. Um, Joel has a title. I mean, gosh, it, it, they got some championship pedigree on this team. Right. So I – I mostly agree with what you're saying. Um, the chemistry piece I think is important because we definitely saw it, it took a good amount of time for the Liberty to, to get their shit together a, a season ago. But at the same time, we have to recognize that John Paul Jones wasn't fully healthy. And in this case, we have Skylar Diggins Smith who actually it's been a while, but she did play with Jewel Lloyd at Notre Dame. I think they're really good friends. And then you're also talking about Neka Agumake, who's one of the, like, is she like the most mature, like majestic creature of the W? I mean, we saw her, I, I told you guys, I saw her at the draft. She's the, um, she's involved in the the players association. She might be like the, the she's president. She's the head. Yeah. yeah. Well, she's so freaking presidential. I saw her like, <laughs> Like Paige Beckers and AZ Fudd, there was some sort of mix up with their seats at the draft. And they were just like kind of standing around. Nobody knew what to do. Like they were like talking to like the theater employees over in Brooklyn. And then like NECA pops up and she just makes it all happen and like starts directing people to like move and like allow these young ladies to get to their seats so they could see their UConn teammates drafted. I'm like, like she's going to be, she's going to come in and ju- be, be just fine. So I do, um, I think the chemistry might be a little bit better in this situation than what we saw um, last season, but it is a big jump to go from 11 wins to maybe 24. I mean, like a dozen more wins. It's, it's a big jump and something else that we have to keep in mind too, perhaps we'll come into play more with even the aces because they have more players on the Olympic team, but let's not forget the Olympic break. And could that, provide uh some fatigue maybe for like a jewel lloyd down the stretch jim yeah i think there's a ton of good points i think you you led with one about how uh i had forgotten to mention that in the aces cap but that's such a good point of you know there are high there's more teams at the top of this league the aces daniel pointed out they're like their spread differential sometimes gets comical they're you know they're favored by 17 and a half and they're covering every every game so if they're getting more challenges from the top of the league i definitely think that you know bites into a potential over for them we also bring in really good points about the backcourt and to me the two players in the backcourt are the pivot points for for seattle because i'm insanely high on seattle i'm i'm really really high on seattle i actually think that as far as team fit is concerned i think that this the team fit for Seattle might actually be better than the team fit for New York, where you have a little bit of overlapping skills in the backcourt and the frontcourt with what New York has. I think, first of all, I think NECA is the fourth best player in the WNBA. I think really Ooh. behind those three that finished at the top three in the MVP last season, I have NECA as my fourth best player. Even at her age, she had her best, she had her best season since 2017 last year. And I think even more than that, if I were to choose a star to build around, She's so easy to build around. She she brings literally everything to the table and takes nothing off. And I think that's why the, the backcourt is going to be such a key pivot because Jewel Lloyd has been on super teams. She's been on title teams, yes. but that was before she kind of broke out. She was, I mean, she was leading scorer in the WNBA last season. Now she's going to have a lot of good teammates. Is she going to be looking to press? Is she going to be like, hey, you know what? I have played a supporting role. Now I'm even better and I can really be a one or one a with NECA. I'm not going to, I might not lead the league in scoring again, but we could win a title. I think that she is going to make that transition. It's part of why I'm really high on Seattle. Skylar Diggins Smith. I think the question is more health coming back from a year off. Maybe health isn't even the right word conditioning, just, sure. you know, body and, and getting back into shape and all that stuff. It's incredible, incredibly high ask. But I think she's up for it. I mean, she was first team all W the two seasons before last. Like, this is truly like a top 10 talent in the league if she is healthy. It wasn't her first kid either. Like, she's come back before. Yeah, she's done it. Yeah, exactly. That's a great point. And so actually, there's I'm so high on Seattle, first of all, that I'm on their I'm on their title odds when they were a little bit longer. I think at this number, I do want to see Skylar Diggins Smith come back. I do want to see how the team meshes a little bit. But I think that the pieces are really there. And I'll say this, you know, I mentioned about it, it, and you mentioned too, it's hard to find news. Gabby Williams is one who I thought she was just for sure out for the season. 
supposedly she actually might be an unrestricted free agent who might be able to return. She is literally the perfect piece for this Seattle team. And it's where she played last. It wouldn't be a huge stretch for her to come back here. If if you get a starting five of Jewel Lloyd, Skylar Diggins Smith, Gabby Williams, who's like the ultimate Swiss Army knife defender, doesn't she's incredibly efficient on offense, does everything kind of like a Benigel Lane, who, who brings so yeah. much on like a super team. And then you have Neko Gumake and Ezi Magvigor, who we haven't mentioned, but is yeah. one of the best young rim protectors in the league. I mean, that, and then they have a really good bench unit. Their bench unit was kind of quietly really strong down the season. I actually made, I made a mid-season wager on the storm to go over the win total because they started to get some pieces together with Sammy Whitcomb. Uh, Jordan Horston is probably the one who's going to play the three right now. And I love her as a bench option. Her starting at the three is a little bit of a, a bigger ask. She's a second year player. She wasn't super efficient last year, but I, I think she could make some improvements this year. I love this team. I'm looking for a lot of ways to play them. I'm taking the over on the win total. I'm going to potentially be looking at their title odds. I like NECA's MVP odds. I even like Skyler Diggins Smith, 130 to one MVP. It's probably not happening. This is probably yeah. your CLV sandwich. But if she comes back to the level she's at, if you're getting 130 to one MVP odds on a player who's right around all WNBA, I mean, that's just a, a bad number. So if you're the type who loves to build a little portfolio and, you know, end up with the top five in the, in the MVP race and you bet them all, I think at 131, you kind of have to hop on Skylar Diggins Smith. Once we see if she comes back, that number may shrink a little bit. But I, I mean, I'm all over Seattle in a lot of ways. I think the fit is perfect. I, I think Noel Quinn has had a couple of years to get her feet wet. I, I just I'm I'm all aboard the Seattle team. I'm really high on on them short term, long term. You, you talked actually. I'm sorry, I'm rambling here, but I, I one more point. Uh, just on you talked about the the Liberty coming together slow, and they they did certainly have a much better second half than a first half. But even the first half, they were pacing in about 27 win team. If if the Seattle Storm are potentially even like a better fit and can maybe yeah. come together quicker, and we've got a 24 and a half in the market here. I, I definitely like the over. So I'm 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 all aboard the the storm train this season. Clearly. Well, <laughs> and talking <laughs> about talking about MVP, why not also take a look at Jewel Lloyd at plus yeah. 1600? I mean, she was I think if the if the storm weren't so bad, I mean, she was easily in the MVP conversation a season ago and then Neka Neka you mentioned and she's at about plus 3000. <laughs> Right now, I kind of like the idea of seeing the first couple games, seeing how Sky Dig looks, and also keep in mind too a good strategy might be all right, maybe they struggle the first couple of games because they're getting used to it. It's a very new roster, and you're probably going to get even a better price on anything for them uh, down the road in terms of title odds. That was actually something that happened with the Liberty. Liberty last season, their odds were one thing, a l- little bit of struggling out of the gate. Um, remember they lost their first game to Washington. Yeah, that's a um, great call. And, and the, the odds were a little bit more favorable. So we have a couple teams down and a few more to go. Next one, I want to get into the Dallas Wings. They are at about plus 2,200. Now they were fourth in the league last season, 22 and 18. Uh, and their win total is about 19 and a half. Um, the big question here, and we, we talked about just trying to find reports on health and status, Satu Sabali. Um, so she had a shoulder procedure in February. She's an all-star. Um, and it looks like she might be out until the Olympic break ends, uh, which by the way, is mid July into early August. So something to keep in mind, um, but otherwise, uh, I- interesting team here. Not like a ton of offseason moves, but year two for Latricia Trammell. I think she made some headway last year. So, Dana, how do you feel about Dallas? Uh, I huge Satu Sobley fan and, and just dropped my phone. But I I do have a little source out in Dallas and uh, who's affiliated with the team. And they said they don't expect Sobley to – be playing at all uh doesn't want to risk uh the possibility of missing at any all. games no i mean at all until the olympic break okay uh, oh, okay <laughs> like doesn't want to like so if like you're thinking of an early return um probably not happening uh she's a huge piece for that german national team and doesn't want to miss any games there Common so the sources yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, you know, I'm. Dano knows everybody, by the way. Just <laughs> he truly we does. experience this when we're, you know, in public, especially at events like the draft. It's like Dano saying hi to, you know, league execs and. Well, and if he doesn't know them, and... he's going to introduce himself and then get to know them instantly. <laughs> not, not in a weird way, though. Not a weird no, way. No, no, no. Oh, no. In a way no. that's like, hey, this guy will buy you a beer, like you know, yes. like <laughs> totally absolutely. chill, completely. Information, popcorn. information is currency. <laughs> and uh, especially in the business of betting. So yes. uh, I am staying away from, from Dallas. I would think I was on their under last year around the same number. I think it was 20 and a half and they got to 21 at the end of the year. And it's a team that, yes, can beat the Giants of the league. We saw them beat the, the Aces last year at home. They beat the Liberty in New York. Uh, and then we also saw them go, what, 0-4 against the Sparks? Maybe 1-3? I mean, some they were bad losses. Volatile, yeah. Bad losses against the Sparks. Like, they can beat anyone and they can lose to anyone. But uh, I do like what Coach Trammell is building. Uh, I'm excited to see uh, former UConn and Fairfield guard Lou Lopez Seneschal. I don't know when she's going to be playing, but like, I think she's already been playing internationally, Dano. I think I saw she was on the Spanish Spanish league and, and did very well. And she didn't play at all last season. So I think she could be a really big piece. Yeah. I I don't know if she's already like in training camp though. I I heard she might be coming late. uh, That could be last I last I saw. So I really hope the game translates. I think she is the type of player uh that that the wings really need like somebody who can go get a bucket uh someone who's solid defensively um anyone who's coming from that you know geno coaching system like plays defense you don't have to worry about that uh especially when Enrique is not having her efficient nights you need another guard and i think that's something they were missing last year uh they're big so i'm not worried about it at all uh especially now that they have uh Kalani brown locked down uh tier mccowan healthy for a full year uh, hopefully she doesn't get hurt going over to play for Turkey, which is random. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I still think somewhat easy of a, of a schedule to start out, but I don't want to touch their win total, uh, probably until after all-star break. And I could see this team making a, making a nice little run, but still a few pieces away. Yeah. Jim, any follow-up thoughts? Yeah, I think I'm pretty much in lockstep with Dano. I think he said it really well um, in terms of this team. They can be anyone and they can also lose to anyone. I, this personally for me is mostly a stay away. I would lean and there's a couple teams here and I, uh, I've i got a win total article coming out um, where I walk through this. It's a, it's a very strange uh, dichotomy I have where, where there's a couple teams where I lean towards over on their win total, but I lean towards betting them to miss the playoffs. You can also get those make miss playoffs. Um, mm-hmm. And that's in part because I'm really low. I like win total wise. I think there's two teams in this league. They're going to soak up a lot of losses. One team in particular is going to soak up a lot of losses. So I think the, the middle of the pack in the W can kind of float around that 500 number, especially if I also see the aces regressing a little bit, there are wins to be had out there, but there's nine and maybe 10. If you, if you want to get frisky with the mystics, probably, probably nine teams really competing for the playoffs though. So these numbers on the make miss playoffs, you can get some really long odds on some of these teams that have, like say Sabali isn't able to play, you know, like what if she re re aggravates or something, then suddenly this looks like a team that's like, all right, let's rebuild for maybe one more year. But yeah. overall, I do think this is, this is a really strong team. Um, I really love the potential for them in the long run, because just like Dano said, so we get, we get to slot in maybe some of these rookies. Lou Lopez is like exactly what they need. They slot in her, or yeah. I guess she's, yeah, is she technically a rookie? Is that what you were asking about earlier, actually? Was it about her? I I was. I was a- asking in our Action Network WNBA Slack what the rule is. Is this like a Ben Simmons situation where she's technically <laughs> still considered a rookie? Uh, I'm not I'm not 100% sure on that. Got to gotta confirm. Um, but yeah, she, um, but she's got the experience. She's 25 years old. Like I said, she's been playing overseas, super mature. Well, and Maddie Seacrest is going to be in her second year. So there's there. I kind of love getting those young players, getting their feet wet while Sabali's out. And then this is a team that I think because of like, like Dano was talking about, they can beat the aces. We've seen them give the aces a lot of trouble last couple of seasons. They, they can play with the best teams. So if we get to the postseason and they, you know, we always talk about path, right? Like if the bracket breaks right for the wings and it's like, Oh, you know what? 
Like they're facing a banged up Liberty team in the first round, and then they can avoid the aces of the finals. This is going to be a team that I'm definitely going to have my eyes on to, to play in some way. If their ceiling comes out, right. If Sabali comes back, if yeah. their bigs are fully healthy, but it's a team that I think is their ceiling is not being correctly priced by the market. So it's a team that for now I'm fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm with I, at least Dano. And I don't know about you, Maria, but I'm fine just sitting out for the moment. But in the long run, I really love their ceiling and I'll probably look to be get to getting in on the ceiling for them in some way. But there's no rush. Let, let's wait. Let's see everything, how it all un, unfolds, because they're never going to be priced accurately if they are fully healthy going into the postseason. Right. I think for me right now, there's just still a little bit too much unknown. So they had, like I said, 22 wins last season, you know, so you would think, oh, they they can they can hit 20 or so. But at the same time, I'm just not sure how much regression we could see, especially without Satu. All right, let's move it along. We got three more teams to talk about, and we'll run through them relatively efficiently here. But I am very excited to talk about the Mercury um, because this is a a team that has, you know, one of the greatest of all time, Diana Taurasi. Um, She's a self-proclaimed psycho, if you just... (laughs) checked out an article I think that dropped today on CT Insider because the reason I say that people are like why the hell are you still playing right like she's entering her 20th season apparently feels the need to try to play in a sixth Olympics (laughs) and get you know get another gold medal I guess if you if you can do it like why stop um and and not only that uh she has been in the media a bit lately because um, some fans of Caitlin Clark, I think, have taken a bit of offense to her <laughs> suggesting that there might be a little bit of a learning curve when Clark gets to the league. Um, I personally think that the reactions to to that were a bit overblown. I think Diana Taurasi is hilarious. Like if you've been following the league for a while, she's just that type of person, very strong personality, says what's on her mind. She didn't say like like Caitlin was going to suck or anything. She was just like, hey, like you're going to, you know, it's going to be harder for you in year one, which I don't doubt at all. So no, no hate for DT in that regard, talking smack, but it is, um, it is interesting to me. I mean, she really is like the LeBron James of the W she broke the all-time scoring record a season ago. So she's a 10,000 point score. Like I said, 20th season, like what, but she could, you know, you could still see flashes of that greatness last season. She kind of picked and chose her spots. Now though, the team is going to be way better. Um, I mean, a season ago, they had Brittany Griner returning from an absolute nightmare situation being wrongfully detained in Russia. Really, really scary. She comes back, actually had a legit all-star campaign, despite everything, despite, you know, all of that. We already mentioned they did not have Sky Sky Dig. Um, but now they have had a, a very nice offseason. Add Natasha Cloud, who is a great two-way guard. Add Kalia Copper, a former finals MVP coming over from Chicago, extremely explosive, um, can score with anyone. And then a nice trade bringing in Rebecca Allen, who was great last year for the Connecticut Sun. So all signs point to an improved season for the Mercury. It's just what exactly is their ceiling? And uh, we're seeing title odds plus 3,500 and a win total at about 18 and a half. Only won nine games a season ago, uh, which is crazy. Worst record in the league. But, I mean, I definitely could see them. I don't know. I feel like I could see them winning winning 10 more games, Jim. Yeah, absolutely. To, th- this team, to me, is the – they have the widest gap between their floor and their ceiling. I could see – there is a world in which I could see, you know, if, if DT – it's year 20. Like at some point she's, <laughs> she has to show some signs. I mean, on the defensive end, she's shown, shown signs for a little bit, but overall, you know, she could be like a net negative value player and not, this is not to, you know, crap on her. It's year 20. It's, it's natural. That's how, that's how it works. Hold on. Can I just make a, make a statement real quick? It's like when it's like selective hearing, it's just selective defense. I think <laughs> a little yeah. bit, but anyway, continue. No, it's very well put. <laughs> she, she can in moments she'll, she'll show up for sure. But on a night to night basis and, you know, 40 game season now uh, that, that, that takes, you know, one game per year of her life. That's uh, you know, that's a little tricky. So uh, Natasha cloud, theoretically perfect fit right next to Tarasi, you know, great defender. So she can take whoever is the best 
um, the guard that they're facing up against. She's also been inefficient at times in her career, especially in the regular season. I think in the postseason, you know, I, I don't want to be going against Natasha Cloud, that's for sure. Kalia Copper, kind of the same deal, can kind of have have moments of inefficiency during the regular season. We're talking about former finals MVP here. Uh, Brittany Griner, you know, again, for a, she's outstanding player, but maybe not the best fit. Like everything I loved about Seattle, about their fit, Phoenix yeah. is almost yeah, like it all like I could definitely see things kind of going awry here in Phoenix. So I like there is a world in which Phoenix misses the playoffs to me. I don't think that is a, an absolutely crazy th- outcome. But I also kind of the, the the number that the books have hung. I'm actually very surprised. It seems to have underreacted to mm-hmm. to the all of these offseason moves. It makes me think that either the market is is smarter than I think or they maybe are missing something. I'm actually a little bit confused about this win total because if you had asked me what the win total would have been set at, I would have guessed about 22, something around there. Seeing yeah. it down around 18, 19 is, is pretty surprising to me. So I actually do lean towards over. But again, this is another one of the teams where I lean towards over from like the floor perspective or from the uh, from like the kind of median range. But I also think that they have a floor where they miss the playoffs. So I might be looking to sprinkle them to miss the playoffs at the right number as well. So this is a team to me that I could see a variety of outcomes. They're also a team that come postseason, I'm going to be more scared of. Cloud and Copper in particular, and even DT to a degree, are players who I think can really kind of step up their, you know, their, I I don't even know how to phrase it exactly, but those inefficiencies on offense that sometimes are more glaring in the regular season are just tough shots in the postseason that everyone gets. And they kind of live in that, in that mode at all times. So they lose less value than, you know, someone who is theoretically very, um, you know, very efficient during the regular season, but that slips a bit in the postseason. So this is a team that in the postseason could scare me, but right now, I'm not hammering any play on the Suns. I will look, I'll say this from like a game to game perspective. I think they are going to get absolutely crushed on the glass. It's kind of crazy, but Brittany Griner is not a very good rebounder. She averages about <laughs> six rebounds a game for a career for someone who's like the biggest player in the league. Yeah. I think she good. really cleaned the glass, but not so much. And then at power forward, they might be starting like Beck Allen might be there for, or, yeah. or Morgan Birch. Like it's not, it's not going to be great on the glass for them. So I'm going to be looking at like, especially if Dallas, plays Phoenix, I think, you know, Tierra McCowan could grab 20 rebounds, 10 of them on the offensive glass. It's something like that. So from a game to game perspective, there's definitely edges against Phoenix, but overall, I, I think that I lean towards their win total over and and maybe playing the floor to miss the postseason. but n- neither are crazy big plays for me, to be honest. So really quick, um, Dan, I will get a quick thought from you, but just want to shout out our um, buckets brother podcast that uh talks nba which jim is on all the time and i don't even think you realize jim you actually accidentally Ugh. said phoenix suns instead of oh Mercury. no that's it's wild okay. because I'll, i'm gonna blame it that we're in the postseason because yes. i have done the opposite probably more often no, oh, i don't that's say this worst. to call you out i say this no to please do on your versatility because he's on these these nba shows all the time but one point i did want to make I literally had to th- think about it in Google. I'm like, who the hell is Phoenix's coach again? It's a man named Nate Tibbetts, who yep. um, I don't think any of us had heard of. Um, it was a little bit of a head scratching hire. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dano, on this. But I do think that's a little bit of, I got to see what's going on there from a coaching perspective before I bet this as well, Dano. Yeah, well, he did let us know that he is a girl dad. So <laughs> that, That's uh, a good thing. <laughs> Thank God. Um, <laughs> I I could see, you know, everything that like Matt Ishbia turns to just absolute crap, you know, like <laughs> it, it could happen. But I, I mean, the team is like got, got a really fun composition. I, I love the draft pick of Charisma Osborne. I think she has a real chance to like be a solid like uh, backup guard here. Uh, she plays D well. Um, Sug Sutton gave you amazing minutes. I think she had a triple double last year. Uh, spicy Sophie Cunningham, she, like everyone's like oh, least favorite about player. Sophie. And how about Sophie and Kalia together? They, yeah. they had a little bit of oh. a rivalry a couple years ago in the postseason. Yeah, I don't want to see Aces training camp on NBA TV. Give me Phoenix, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, absolutely, I mean, I think this team's ceiling is like straight up putting DT on the bench and they'll never do that. Uh, (laughs) Like I, I I mean, Jim talked about, you know, having Beck Allen at the four, but like that 
can absolutely work uh, in today's WNBA. Um, you can win games just like losing the battle of the boards. So, uh, I mean, I think this team is going to be so unique. Kalia Copper is not a great defender. Like, uh, in fact, she's quite bad. Uh, DT is the worst. Uh, like I've said online, the worst defender. In All right, the I, I'm starting to feel bad now about the the digs at, at <laughs> Diana's defense. But oh, I I I mean, I wasn't. I mean, I was great in college at defense, but now if you saw me at the rec center, I'm getting blown by everybody. So, uh, <laughs> I I'm, I'm a gym. Like the variance is crazy with this team. It's gonna be fun. Uh, I think we really got to see the type of style like you were talking about with uh, coach Tibbetts. Like we don't really know um, what to expect uh, stylistically from this team. Are they going to be a run and gun type of team, push the pace? Are they going to be uh, slow and really try to uh, force things? We've seen a lot of teams play zone. I mean, this team played so much zone over the past two years uh, because they just weren't good defensively. So uh yeah, it's it's something I will definitely be looking forward to watching uh, preseason. I think uh, there's still time to see how some of these teams come out and play in those preseason games. It's very important to, to notice. But uh, either way, it's like first team all fun for sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we got two more teams to get to. And, and this first one, the Lynx, looking at about plus 5,000 title odds. I think this is a team that we all feel like there are actionable things here on this team um so 16 and a half is their win total they were 19 and 21 a season ago ended up with sixth place in the standings and um Jim I think you talked about how the way the league is set up there's a a really good chance that those middle of the road teams are going to be very tight um maybe hovering around 500 that's what we saw a season ago um I feel like this is a bit low for the links. Um, that's just my opinion because, uh, first of all, so they went over this a season ago. They started the season horribly. If you recall, I forget how many straight yeah. losses, but they seven. came at seven straight. There you go. Dan will remembers. I'm sure there were bets tied to it that make him. Remember <laughs> um, but In a good way, but well. I mean, they really, they, the fact that they made the playoffs and not only that, they um they had a playoff win against Connecticut like you based on the start that they had like they you would not have expected them to ascend in the way that they did um so i feel pretty confident that they're going to be a better team than they were a season ago they add Natisha Heideman they add Courtney Williams they add Alana Smith they draft Alyssa Peely um a lot of a lot of talent there i trust Cheryl Reeve Cheryl Reeve for anyone who's unfamiliar, easily one of the best coaches in the league, um, definitely has a great reputation. And how about this? Under Cheryl Reeve, they have made the playoffs 12 of 14 years. The only times they did not were her very first season as head coach and two seasons ago when Nafisa Collier, who is their MVP player essentially, was out on maternity leave. And remember too, she was kind of still coming back from, from that. She did come back uh, late in that season on maternity leave because she wanted to play with Sylvia Fowles, who was like a legend that was retiring, but she still, she wasn't close to like a hundred percent. Um, Kayla McBride playing way better. She was extended actually just before the postseason a season ago, another year with them two playing together. Um, so I am definitely looking at the links to make the playoffs at about minus minus one sixty. Jim, I, and Dano, I believe, like this. Um, and Jim, I think you also like over their win total. So, Jim, I'll start with you on this. Yeah, I'm, I'm very high on them. In fact, I'm so high on them that I I did the thing I, I try to kind of sometimes do, which is like, why am I so far off? And I, I think the answer actually is kind of obvious the more I dug into it. So I, I don't know if people out there are familiar with like Pythagorean win-loss. Basically, the theory is your point differential is actually more predictive of how you will do the next season than your actual win total. So you'll see this a lot in football where a team will like kind of quote unquote, get lucky to win, you know, they'll have, there'll be a minus two points scored, but they go uh, 11 and five. I don't even know how they, how many games they play in football. I don't follow football at all. <laughs> I don't know why I use football as an example. I, I basically don't follow the sport. I don't remember it, how many. It's, a, it's a cross sports. 
point differential is more predictive for the next season than your win loss because there's just there's more noise in wins and losses and typically teams that win a bunch of close games it's not repeatable year to year so the the book the the sports books know that so what they look at is a season in which minnesota Lynx went 19 and 21 last year but they had the point differential of a 12 and 28 team so by point differential they were actually a pretty bad team last year i think they were like the third worst team in the WNBA. however I, I am disre- I'm not disregarding it, but I actually think it offers us a perfect opportunity to zag off of that knowledge from the sports books. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. I think, first of all, this team with Cheryl Reeve and Nafisa Collier is a, basically the number one team I would trust in a clutch situation. You mentioned Cheryl Reeve as one of the best coaches in the league. She's one of the best coaches of all time, even. I think you said that. She's, she's a gr- phenomenal coach. Nafisa Collier, to me, is like, you talked about, Neka Ogumake and how she's, you know, kind of this like regal statesman and like just like yeah. a perfect player to build around. The Fisa Collier seems like the, the, uh, is it Gen Z that she would be in? Whatever generation she is, she's that equivalent. She's kind of the, the next in line to, to take that over from Neka. She's, she can do every single aspect of the game. She's a great leader and teammate. I, I have her as a top five player. There's your top five. I've got the, the big three and then I've got Neka and Collier. Those are my five best players in the league. So I'm very high on them and I'm fine not worrying as much about the Pythag and actually letting that drag down their win total so that we can bet the over. I think in, you mentioned Heidemann and Courtney Williams coming in. I think those are going to be the best ball handlers Minnesota has had since like the Lindsey Whalen days. They've kind of cycled through point guards, you know, struggle. I saw Dano's face. Dano definitely is with me on that one. They've, they've cycled through many a point guard here. Um, Courtney Williams, uh, if you missed it last year, she turned into a great playmaker. She was doing a lot out of the pick and roll in Chicago. She was excellent. Her assists per game were career high. So I, I, you know, I, I did try to be like, man, why am I so far off the market here? I really think it's that Pythagorean win loss that has really had a big impact on futures markets across sports. And I think it's being overweighted here. I think mm-hmm. Minnesota had an awesome off season. I think they have an awesome core and I think they have a great coach and star that kind of, it makes them built to, overperform potentially a, a projected win total or a Pythag win total. So I'm, I, I love Minnesota. I'm with you on making the playoffs at minus 155 and I'm with you on over on their win total. Dano, anything we haven't mentioned in, in talking about the links and why you like them? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely echoing a lot of the sentiments for sure. Uh, but I'm excited to see the the sophomore jumps for Diamond Miller, who, Ooh, I mean, they were, they were games. Point. Great point. There were games where she's like, I mean, could absolutely looking at like a future MVP type player because there's not that many players of her. I mean, she's very Satu Sabali esque, like can can shoot, can attack, kind of wing slasher. There's too many great huh? wing I'm slashers. Sure. In the league. Sorry to interrupt. I'm pretty sure she was a rookie of the month one once last season yes. like i'm pretty yes. sure she, she yeah. took one from Aliyah boston which is saying something because <laughs> boston was uh, the clear like rookie of the year no and i already know who else you're gonna bring up no well uh, yeah and i feel like i i swear at some point you were like hey is it worth like uh taking a flyer on diamond miller for rookie of the year last year like uh, like i feel like you brought that up because she I was on a tear um yeah and then i mean dorka my god um the experience that she got last year on a playoff team, starter minutes, because, I mean, losing Jessica Shepard for the entire year is tough, but, I mean, they basically played uh, the entire season without her. So, um, or not the entire, but at least half the season without her. Uh, she's an amazing player, but still. Uh, and I'm with Jim. The, the jump that Fee took last year um, as a scorer specifically, and scorer and a rebounder is is crazy. Uh I, I have way too much invested on them already. Uh, but like, yeah, you know, would absolutely go in more. I think uh, to make playoffs should be for this team kind of right around where the Fever probably sitting like at minus two fifty. Wow, interesting. Hmm. Okay. Okay. We got one more team to get into here. Uh, the Sparks have the worst odds in the West uh, as far as title is concerned. Plus. 8,000. Their win total is a measly nine and a half at this point. Um, I think both of you took the under when it was more like 11 and a half. So keep an eye, you know, in case that number 
fluctuates, um, but they were 17 and 23 last year. They've just been gutted. They're in, in true rebuild mode. They did draft some exciting young rookies, Cameron Brink, Rakia Jackson. They've added a couple um, vets like Kia Nurse, Ari McDonald. Um, but what they lost, we already have raved about Neka Agwumike. I mean, she was really like the face of the franchise, um, the Samuelsons. And then Jasmine Thomas retired. Oh, that hurts. Uh, so not super high expectations for the Sparks this year. And I, I think none of us would be surprised if they did finish um, the worst t- team record wise this season, Jim. Yeah, absolutely. And and you you laid out really nicely a lot of the talent that left. They also lost Jordan Canada in a trade to Atlanta, and she was very key for their offense. Between losing Jordan Canada, who is basically the staple of their offense, and Neko Gumake, who is a top four or five player in the W, yeah, they're in they're in teardown mode. And I gotta shout you out here because before before the podcast, I was like, to me that everything makes sense. They're gonna be they're gonna be tanking, but I can't think of a good pun for Paige Beckers because that's that's the clear prize. <laughs> next year and you're like I feel like I heard this somewhere but I like turning the page and I I absolutely love that because that's what LA should be doing they should be turning the page for page because this <laughs> team you know I actually Laisha Clarendon to me is is the most interesting piece because they're the type of player who can like kind of float a team to like a decent offense and a decent defense or just incredibly solid player I think that's the reason that they are not on this team by the end of the season because if I'm the if I'm the Sparks, I, the last thing I want to do is is you know kind of stumble my way into more wins than the uh, the Sky and the Mystics and end up with the third pick and miss out on Paige Beckers. A, a young core of Paige Beckers, Cameron Brink, and Rakia Jackson is like the kind of stuff you dream of. The Sparks mm-hmm. should be doing everything in their power to make sure they have the number one pick this year. I I think that they are like kind of clearly the worst roster in the WNBA. And that's not to say this is a bad team. I, I talked about this in my in my column. It's just that the WNBA is at a place because expansion has not happened where there's a lot of talent on teams that are not going to win many games. Like even if you looked at Phoenix was the worst team last year, they had Brittany Griner. Like right. it, it just, it takes a lot of talent to be a good winning team in the W right now. So I mean, it's this is a team with Az- Azure Stevens. There, there is talent on this team, but just in comparison to the rest of the league, I think they have the worst roster. If I look back over history, the worst teams typically average around 80 wins per 40 games. If you know, obviously the 40 game thing is new, but if I, if you just go by winning percentage, it translates to about eight wins per season. I think they're going to be even a little bit worse than, than the average worst team. So I have them kind of in the six to seven win range. That sounds crazy, but I really think that, that there's so much talent in this league right now that you can have a good team and you just kind of come out on the wrong side of a lot of games. I think they'll be respectable, but there's so much they're going to the, if they're smart, they're going to give a lot of minutes to Rakia, a lot of shots to Rakia, a lot of minutes to Cameron Brink, to let her play through foul time. Just let the young players do their thing and hope, hope you get the, hope you get the worst record and you, and hope you get a little bit lucky and you get what get Paige Beckers because that trio that's like how you build an actual future. So there's no incentive to win for the Sparks here. I, I see them going under and and kind of having the worst record in the league by far, to be honest. Dano, final thoughts on the Sparks before we wrap this up. Uh, still one of the best coaches in the league, which is which is scary when taking uh, this team's under. And uh, Lacey Clarendon just finds a way to make sure their team always covers for some reason. I feel like they're going to be a profitable team for me this year. I just, I really do. I think the the lines are going to be super inflated. Um, I think if uh, Ray Peebley is smart, uh, makes some moves at the trade deadline, I think my ultimate fan fiction here <laughs> is Sparks trade Bjerka Hamby to the New York Liberty. <laughs> Revenge oh. spot. <laughs> and I mean, can you imagine? Uh, oh my God! I mean, the Liberty need a backup big. We'll we'll talk East soon, but uh, that's my ultimate dream. Uh, and I think Clarendon can help out any contender. Uh, so I mean, like like they definitely have pieces. Lexi Brown's one of the best shooters in the WNBA. Maybe running her mouth too much about the Caitlin Clark stuff too, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I uh, <laughs> all right. It's it's gonna be a fun team. Uh, and Kurt Miller's often or teams, by the way, uh, I want to say over the last three years outside of the Mystics, like um, I want to say 
like his teams over the last three years are second best in terms of unders. So uh, mm. an under team for sure, I think. And, and yeah, I think we're going to see a lot of inflated lines. Um, but yeah, uh, do what you got to do to get Paige. Um, yes. <laughs> you know, Liberty, Liberty yeah. do have a draft pick from Phoenix this year. Uh, we know they were the worst team in the league last year. So hopefully that two year record is bad. Uh, Cause if Paige ends up on the, liberty it's over for the rest of the people (laughs) (laughs) all right well let's leave it there because i want to save any other anecdotes for when we preview the eastern conference which is going to be happening tuesday of next week keep an eye out for that episode we are planning to have episodes every tuesday and friday during the WNBA season which tips off may 14th so In between that Eastern Conference preview and the season tipping off, we are actually going to do another episode that Friday. It's going to be all about Caitlin Clark. And if you're or if you're sick of Caitlin Clark, too bad, because we got a lot (laughs) to discuss. And also there are a lot of bets, betting markets available around Caitlin Clark, which is why we feel we need to discuss this. So that's going to happen the following Friday. Keep an eye out. All right. And that's going to do it for our Western Conference preview. And the premiere episode of Buckets WNBA on its very own feed for the very first time. A reminder, please get to know us, subscribe to this channel. And if you like what you heard today, definitely rate and review this podcast. Also a reminder, download the award-winning action app. You'll see where we are tracking our picks. It's an incredible tool and it'll be very useful for you during this WNBA season. Until next time, for Jim Turvey, Dan Omataya, our producer Matt Mitchell, I'm Maria Marino, and we will see you next time. Let's get buckets.